like to welcome to the show Matthew Khalil. How you doing, brother? Good. I'm really happy to be here, Alex. Thank I'm super excited. Man, thank you for being on the show. I know you are. I love doing international calls. I love it. I do international interviews. You are in South Africa as we speak. I am. What time is it? Right now. Uh, right now it's about uh, nine thirty in at night. Oh, geez. So you're like all awake and you're like, Woo, and I'm like, okay, I, I gotta go to bed now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always but, excited. Uh, yeah, I mean, to, I'm always excited to do international calls. I just did an Australian call a little while ago. It's cool. it's so cool to to. It's amazing the technology how it works. Yeah, yeah, it's incredible. I love it. I love it. I love it. I'm sitting here in Johannesburg and it's like really hot and it's it's a lovely day. So yeah, I'm dying. I'm actually one of the one of the places on my bucket list is I gotta go to South Africa. I do definitely oh, want to travel. Do. I love it. I I, I would love to go oh, down man. to South Africa. It really is one of my favorite um, countries in Africa that I would actually want to go visit. And uh, you, you must. Yeah, you must Cape Town. So I'm originally from Cape Town, which yeah. is down south, and it's so beautiful. You'll love it, and great to shoot. And ever any excuse to shoot in South Africa, you should do it. Um, well, I uh, it is on my list. Maybe I'll do a workshop next year or something like that down there. Maybe I, yeah. get, I get to fly down there. That would be great. Um, <laughs> so first of all, man, uh, you have an amazing book out called The Three Wells of Screenwriting, which is one of the reasons I wanted to get you on the show. And like we were talking a little bit off air, I'm always fascinated with new uh, techniques or new uh, angles are created mm -hmm. to try to mm -hmm. tell stories. And at the end of the yeah. day, we're all just trying to tell a good story. And there's Absolutely. different flavors on how we get there, whether it's Hero's Journey, whether it's you know Truby's Way, whether it's yep. Save the Cat, whether there's a million exactly. different ways. Yeah. Um, and sometimes certain ways just click with certain writers. Absolutely. Correct? So I was, yeah, really, yeah, I totally. was really interested about your book. Uh, but before we get into your book, how did you get into this crazy business? Wow. Oh, that's a great, it's a great long story. I'll start from the beginning when I was, I was, I was a young boy. 13. Yeah, I was a young boy. I was 13 years old. I actually was. And I, I remember wanting to be a film director from the youngest age. I don't know why. I just loved movies. My dad used to tell me stories mm -hmm. about movies and I used to watch a lot of movies with him. And I remember about 13 walking into the headmaster's office and it was like careers day where you had to like choose a career. Mm -hmm. And this was a long time ago because I'm, I'm much older than I look. And uh, <laughs> I walked into, into his office and he said, and I said, I want to be a film director. And his response was, not in this country, you won't. <laughs> choose something else. So I was like, Whoa, what must I do? So I went back. I looked at the map of South Africa. I saw there were a lot of game farms. So I went back and I said, Okay, I'll be a game ranger. And he said, much better, do geography. And he ticked me off my list, and that was it. So I've wanted to make films from a young, young age, you mm -hmm. know, like from from as far back as I can remember. And I remember the first movies I imagined in my head, and mm -hmm. I've always been fascinated by it. And I guess, you know, once I left school, in, and there weren't many film schools in South Africa at the time, mm -hmm. so um, I kind of wandered around and did a whole lot of other things, which we won't get into because there's not enough time. Sure. But eventually, I, I studied a master's in screenwriting in Leeds in the UK. Okay. And uh, that was after doing, uh, yeah, after doing some work here in South Africa. I wrote some scripts. I just found that I I don't know. I just found that I could do it in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and then and then when I came back with my master's in screenwriting, I started writing sitcom for South African television. And uh, then it just took off from there. And at the same time as I was working as a working writer, I was also teaching. So I was kind of as a parallel teaching, writing and working in, in the in the writing in the writing world, I guess. Yeah. And I, I'd always try to make one film as well as a director. So I always used to try and make one short film a year. Mm -hmm. And that's, I guess, that's how I got into it. Um, in South Africa, um, you, uh, maybe it's a bit like this in the independent scene in the US. Mm -hmm. You've got to be doing many different things. You've got to be having like many different hats. So oh, I'll be doing course. like edit, editing, directing, writing, as many things as I could. Um, but writing's been there all along. And teaching writing as well has been there been there all along. So yeah, I think that answers your question how I yeah. got into this crazy business. And it is crazy. It's, it's even crazy over here. Probably. No, I could only I imagine. <laughs> I mean, I come from a small market as well. In, in the US, I came in from, um, from South Florida. And during in that area, you have to do a thousand things yeah. to survive, like just to be able to make a living. I made a living in South, in, in South Florida for wow. 10 years as an editor, as a director, as all that stuff, and it's it's very difficult. And and if you are a smart filmmaker, if you're a smart even screenwriter who wants to get into the business, you need to be able to do more than one thing. So Absolutely. you're, and I'm imagining Absolutely. that's the way it is in smaller markets yep. that are not Los yep. Angeles, and even here yep. in LA yep. in the indie scene, if you no. don't do everything, it's going to cost you money. That's why I could go out and make exactly. a 
three or four thousand dollar feature film because I have a lot yeah. of hats that I could wear. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you have to. I think you have to. So yeah, that was the way I got in many different ways. But screenwriting was the kind of through line all the time. Yeah. Well, that's where it starts. It all starts with it. It yeah. all starts on the page. Totally. It all starts, it starts on the page. You know, it starts with a blank page, which is kind of what I talk about in my book. I talk about this blank page that we face as screenwriters and it fa that's it. It's you're facing infinity every time you write. Oh, you're facing that flashing cursor and that flashing brutal. cursor is looking at you saying, you can write anything, but what are you going to write? You know, this is what we face every time as writers. And it's, it's always fascinating to me that the writers are often the last person anyone thinks about, you know, like down the line, it's like, you know, the screenwriter, God, we've got to pay him, really? Um, <laughs> meanwhile, <laughs> we're the ones that have like made something out of nothing to start with. So yeah, it all starts with the story. You know, and, and it's, fu it, it's funny though, like I think that goes back to the early days of Hollywood where screenwriters were mm -hmm. literally just treated like absolute crap. Not yep. that it's changed a whole lot, but I think because of the, the, the studio system and the, and the glory days of the Hollywood studio system where they were literally just technicians and, and, and they were just treated like whatever. It didn't matter. Yeah, like, it still kind of yeah. resonates like that today mm. where writers aren't treated with a lot of respect in this genre and genre, screenwriting. As novelists, it's different in, in other areas. Yeah. But I think that's one of the biggest mistakes we make as, uh, as filmmakers as, and as a, an industry. Without question. Now let's get into your, question, yeah. let's get into your book a little bit. So let's discuss your concept of the three wells of screenwriting. Okay, cool. So it's really a simple-ish concept, and I'm going to explain it, and then I'm going to ask you to do a little exercise so we can all experience it. Absolutely, that's the best. Absolutely, and and your your listeners can also do the exercise. So it's really simple. As I was saying earlier, you know, when we're creating, we're facing this flashing cursor of infinity, which are, you know, and and we've got to we, when we write, we draw from three wells within us. This is what happened to me as I, I've kind of been teaching this for a very long time, screenwriting, and I've taught it in the very traditional form. So I've taught, you know, three act structure, you know, writing major turning point documents. Um, and I've looked at all the kind of theories of writing, but a lot of the, the kind of theories of writing in terms of uh, structure, et cetera, is once you've written the thing, you know, you've got something out there. Now, now you can structure it or in the pre-planning phase where you're doing a lot of planning and planning and planning. You get stuck in the plan forever and ever. Hmm. But when you're facing that flashing cursor and you've got to write something, what's happening in that exact moment of creativity? And what I did is I kind of slowed down that creative process, which is why the cover looks very zen. You know, mm -hmm. It's like this kind of meditative three wells mm -hmm. because it's, it's, it's about slowing down the creative process and actually thinking, where do my ideas come from? And when we slow down the creative process, we find that we draw from three different wells within us. And the first one is what I've called external sources wells. This is all the movies you've seen, any media you've consumed, anything that you've watched. That's the external source as well. That's the well number one. Then well number two is your imagination well. You just kind of make it up. So it's like a lightning bolt from above. It comes down, bam, and you whoa, where did this idea come from? Oh, it's unique and original. And you, and you write it. And then the third well is your memories, your unique lived experiences, which you can draw from. And I think you, from what I can see from some of your work, you draw a lot from the memory wells. I've seen some of the features you wrote. You're there. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of memory stuff. You've just told me about something else, which <laughs> is certainly coming from the memory. Yeah. And uh, those are the three wells that we draw from. So to experience those wells, and the idea with the book is that there are about 29 exercises. I call them exercises. They're also experiences and explorations, mm -hmm. more than exercises, which you use to dig these wells deeper. So the idea is that you're never stuck again because you can draw from these wells at any point when you're facing that flashing cursor, the idea is you don't really face writer's block anymore, which is, you know, the ideal aim of the book, hopefully. Mm -hmm. And also that you can draw ideas that are unique to you, that you as a writer um, can only access. And through drawing from those wells, because they move you and they resonate with you, once you put them on the screen, they'll resonate with the audience. And so this all sounds rather ab abstract, and the best way to experience it is to do an exercise. Mm -hmm. So are you up for an exercise? I'll, I'll, I'm all about it. Awesome. Okay, good. Fantastic. Cool. So the best way to explain it is, is to do one of the exercises in the book, which is, um, I call it the graveyard exercise. Also known as, I think you guys call them uh, cemeteries more than graveyards, I think. Mm. In South Africa, we call them graveyards. Cemeteries, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Cemeteries, yeah. Cemetery. cemetery. Okay, cool. So we can call it the cemetery exercise. Um, and in this exercise, I ask people to think of, first of all, if you have to write a scene, right? So it's ex exterior, cemetery, say, day. Mm -hmm. And 
you're sitting there and the first thing you think about, so I'm not, don't think about it, just any images that pop into your head when you say a cemetery scene, just list some for me. What comes in? Uh, a cemetery head? scene? Uh, yeah, zombie, zombies popping out. Okay, zombie, uh, zombie yeah, popping out. Your um, That's your imagination. Well, it's great, but, it, but you uh, went straight there. Yeah. What else? Um, uh, a cemetery. My, if you want to go into the memory stuff, uh, when my oh, no, uh, grandparents. Don't go there yet. Don't no, 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 no. Yet. Okay, okay. Just, just keep first yes, things that, that pop into my head. Okay. I love the fact that you went to the imagination well and the and the external and the memory well first. But like generally, if you had to write a scene for the images that come to mind, if you think um, about it, um, I, I have to think about a theme. So I'm gonna go zombie. Uh, zombies <laughs> coming out of uh, out of the graves. This is all very trite, and we've seen it a million times. But I'm just gonna yeah, throw yeah. it out there. Yeah, go for it. Zombies. Uh, there's a there's a, a you know a little girl walking around, and a zombie oh, grabs her on the leg, yeah. and she's cool. yelling. And then the yeah. hero comes in, who's not a really hero. <laughs> he's kind of like an anti. He's just a normal dude thrown in a weird circumstance, and all of a sudden zombies <laughs> are popping out, and he's got to grab it and help this little girl who he doesn't know, and the mom's already Ooh. dead. Uh, who was visiting her dead husband? It's all crazy. So I'm just, I just I saw it. rolling up. So that's kind of like that's okay. Cool. <laughs> that's fantastic. So so what you're doing there? <laughs> I love the fact that your your imagination is going. But the, but but a lot of people when you say like um, cemetery scene, they're gonna say like you know uh, trimmed grass, you know moss on graves, raining maybe. Right. Maybe it's raining. You I know just there's created umbrellas. A story line in my you head. created a story which I love, and we'll get into that. But that's cool as well because. You were tapping into other zombie type movies, you know. So you, your your mind went to the movies that you've watched, maybe, and the movies that you love, mm -hmm. which is you know clearly horror, and and so so th that's what you filled your external sources well with. Mm -hmm. So what's quite interesting there is normally when I say the cemetery scene, people will say things like I've said, trim grass, grave, maybe someone reading from a little Bible, you know, a little group of uh, mourners standing around the grave with one person standing aside. So there's all these movies we've seen, and our mind's been sort of colonized in a way by all these external sources that we've watched. So when we write a scene, especially if you have to write quickly, you just kind of draw from that stuff. Mm -hmm. And that stuff is, it's unique to you in some ways because your external source as well is full of zombies and- <laughs> Well, yeah, that's the first thing of, that came to my mind when I thought of a, yes, of, 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 of a graveyard. I was like, well, zombies, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> of course, obviously. obviously. So, so that's what you filled your external source as well. It's like all these horror stories, sure. which is why your external source as well is, is kind of unique to you as well, mm -hmm. um, but that's the external source as well. So now we're going to try something something different, mm -hmm. and this is the next well to try and experience this. And I want you to notice what it feels like drawing from these wells because this book is very experiential. Mm -hmm. So you kind of experience these wells when you when you read the book. Um, so that was the first well. It was quick. It was easy. The ideas came. It was just kind of popping out. Let's try the next well, which I call the imagination well. So now I want you to imagine. A graveyard mm -hmm. totally made up mm -hmm. see if you can do that. A, a, a totally made up graveyard yeah something that you're just making up. anything images it can be a scene in a graveyard it can be any it's totally made up just invented out of the blue um a graveyard that has been designed by uh, leonardo da vinci so all of the no, all the architecture around it the gravestones are all in that kind of da vinci style um you know design um, uh -huh. it could be very peaceful, uh, where uh -huh. people are walking around, uh, enjoying the park esque kind of things. <laughs> the grass cool. is trimmed. There is nice moss. Uh -huh. Um, the way people are dressed could be a little bit uh -huh. more unique than, uh, -huh. uh than you normally do would, would you be lean uh -huh. towards the Da Vinci design? I'm just using uh, the cool. core idea of the Da Vinci I love it. I design, love it. uh, and yep. then kind of make a, a, make it a world around it. And Fantastic. That that's kind of like what you know. I mean. you're, you know, Alec, you're you're a natural at this. It's actually quite. I've done this exercise often. People really struggle. You just like slide into each one. Anyway, so the um, what you've done there is quite amazing. Is you've tapped into your your imagination well. Most people, when you say, so I'm hoping that your listeners also doing this when we when we're doing this. So if you guys are listening out there, hopefully you've done the external source as well. And now you're trying to imagine a unique graveyard. A lot of people struggle with the imagination because they feel like suddenly they're being almost tested. They're like, oh, is my imagination good enough? Have I imagined something unique? Oh, and there's a lot of pressure on us. Yeah. And our imaginations are often like suppressed. And we've been told like when we were kids, like stop imagining, stop playing. So people have don't really access their imaginations that easily. But what you've done is something quite cool. You've taken an idea, which is Da Vinci, and you've taken graveyards and you've collided them together and you've sparked off this whole amazing idea of like 
Da Vinci's graveyard. Mm -hmm. And what's cool about that is in the book, I talk about this thing of colliding ideas. So you've jumped ahead in a way. You've Sorry. Got, you, you, yeah, you know. Okay. <laughs> so the idea is with the imagination, well, is that you can just you can make things up by colliding ideas together. That's one way of tapping your well deeper. But mm -hmm. the imagination, you know, you can a, a sort of graveyard in space. Someone's buried in a glass coffin, maybe. You know, mm -hmm. the imagination is is just you kind of make it up. And it's interesting. There's normally a moment of pause where you're waiting for the idea to come. And I saw you did it. You kind of looked down. And then Da Vinci came. Mm -hmm. It's quite amazing. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the imagination well. And tapping into that when we write feels different to tapping into the external sources, which was just like ideas, 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 ideas. Easy, 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 easy. Because it was yeah, imagine. it was interesting. If I may stop you for a second, because yeah. the external no. well, when I when I did the exercise, the external well, I went yeah. straight to movies. I went straight to stories yeah. because yeah. those are all reference points, and I have a vast reference <laughs> library in my mind of, of millions of hours of content that I've consumed in my life. But then when Good. I went to the imagination, I was like, okay, what would be really cool? I was like, oh, Da Vinci. I've never seen that yeah. before. About How yeah. about an entire graveyard designed by Da Vinci with those kind of yeah. insane designs he did? And then colliding yeah. those ideas. It just automatic. And the one thing I want to touch before we move forward yeah. is, and you, you said this, which I think is something that everyone needs to listen to is, when you said like most people get test, they feel like they're being tested yep. or they're, yep. they're, they feel self-conscious about yep. it. I've now gotten to the pl point that I've, I don't give a crap anymore. Yeah, <laughs> so I, I, I don't, I don't care. I, I mean, you know, doing yeah. a podcast, doing what I do with Indie Film Hustle, I get bombarded with negative and positive all the time. So I just don't yeah. care anymore. I've gotten to that point in my life as an artist. I'm like, I don't care what other yeah. people think. I'm just going to do what I want. <laughs> but if you would have asked me the same concept five or 10 years ago, I would have had much more difficulty and I would have been much yeah. more guarded with how I put, put things out. So it's releasing yourself to become yes. free. It, it's so Absolutely. helpful. Absolutely. You know, one of the things in the book I talk about as well is play and just have fun, yeah. you know, and like, and when you see kids playing and, and they're just imagining stuff, they're just going, I'm like, how, where, what is this world you created? That's the kind of ease with which they're creating because they haven't been like, you know, shut down by all this judgment and negative energy and like, you know, things are just like, you know, just, yeah, like, like you, know, you feel the world's assessing your ideas. Whereas I can see you don't, you know, you don't give a crap anymore. You're just going to do it. No. I could see, that was great. That's great. Well done on reaching that phase in your life. You're are clearly it, an involved filmmaker. <laughs> I try, I try, I try, man. It's not easy sometimes, but I try at least. <laughs> Tell me about it. Tell me about it. Anyway, so I'm just going to go on to the last well, and then we can talk about about you know more more things. But so the last well, and again, this is an experience. So again, I want your listeners to try and experience this. Is is the memory well? Now this well is. I want you to try a graveyard exercise or or a or a cemetery exercise and i want you to scan through your life mm -hmm. and and it, so so and think about graveyards or cemeteries you've actually been to mm -hmm. and 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 think of some images or people or encounters or stories that have taken place there anything coming to mind oh absolutely when my grandfather passed uh which was a very difficult time for me and i was at a cemetery and he actually got into the mausoleum and i'll never forget the sound of the coffin being dragged over the concrete they had a plastic uh they had a plastic kind of like tray and then they put the yeah. coffin on it and then they slid it in and the sound oh, is oh still God. in my is still wow. in my head and when they actually closed it off and sealed it you know finally i remember all that so vividly and i wasn't very young oh. i was still probably in my <clears throat> 20s early 20s or late 20s when that happened but I still remember it so vividly and the emotion yep. that I was feeling that day because it was such mm -hmm. a, a powerful thing. But I can sense it. I can smell it. I actually remember Amazing. looking in before they put them in. So when they opened it, I wow. looked in the hole and I saw the wow. concrete hole before they put them in because I was curious on what the final resting place of my grandfather was going to be like. So that's a memory. Wow. That's a straight memory. <laughs> That's amazing. I love it. I love it. That's, you know, can, and I, this is the feeling. Can you feel, right? I don't yeah. know, that, that suddenly the emotions are in the room. Oh, and yeah. That there's, there's like, you know, and like things are moving and there's like, there's like, this is this resonance that I talk about in the book. Mm -hmm. When we tap into our memory wells, we, we create scenes that are just unique and they resonate with that memory, our unique memory. And interestingly enough, you again, you've jumped the gun here because you're talking about uh, the sounds. 
And and what happens when we when we write from our memories is that we can we can activate all our senses. And of course, film is all about senses. You know, it's about the sounds. It's about it's not just about writing. You know, the visuals. Mm-hmm. It's about trying to paint a scene for a for a reader and eventually for an audience that's got all the senses activated. And so what I what I do in the book as well is we talk about memory writing and senses. Mm-hmm. So we've got you know we've got these five senses activated, and you've got the sound that stays with you. Mm-hmm. And I mean, can you imagine trying to even as a filmmaker, even if once you've written the script, trying to describe that sound as mm-hmm. it scrapes in, you know, with the plastic on the concrete? Oh yeah. Um, and that's and that's just a kind of unique, fresh take on. A graveyard scene right mm-hmm. so we uh, so that's the, that's what the memory well gives us when we write and you can see in the book i do tend a little bit more towards the memory well because i think people are really afraid of tapping into that mm-hmm. but um yeah that's 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 the well that, that's really unique and has got some really really fresh things in it and some really really exciting stuff that you can draw from so um yeah so that's it so those are the three wells the external sources well other movies you've seen, imagination well, you make it up, memory well, you tap into it. Mm. And what's really important to remember is I'm not saying that you've got to write a scene about your your grandfather's passing. Uh, sure. you, may, you, you may want to, but at the same time, if you're writing a scene where a superhero is, you know, I don't know, maybe Superman's died mm. and uh, they're burying him and you've got to write the scene, you can still tap into that memory and just have that sound of of the thing shifting into the concrete. And if you draw from that one moment and stick it in your feature film script, it's going to pop. Mm-hmm. And someone reading the script will go like, oh, oh, what is that? That's unique. That's fresh. That, that's interesting. So you can draw from your memory well and stick it into any kind of thing you're writing, which is quite, quite cool, actually. You don't have to write your story. And that's not what I'm really getting at with the book. Right. It's that you can, you can draw from all of them. So you can write a zombie movie, except in the zombie movie, suddenly you stay, you're taking the sound and you're sticking it into the zombie movie and suddenly you've got this unique moment. And I also really loved what you shared about the, um, like looking into the grave before it went in. Mm-hmm. That moment just seemed really fresh and interesting to me. And um, yeah, so so that's that's the kind of power of writing from the memory. So those well, so I could see how these three wells can really spark ideas. Yeah. very yeah, easily. Absolutely. If you if you're open, like if you're open and free, you know we've you know just right here doing this, we've written a yep. scene about if we compl- yeah. and if we collide all three of the wells together, exactly. we have a Whoa. a zombie movie that takes yeah. place in a Da Vinci designed graveyard. With authentic Absolutely. sounds of of a real exactly. of, of a real graveyard inside of it, unique things that I've totally. I've never seen anything like that before. Yeah, totally. No, I, <laughs> what I find amazing about this exercise is when I do it, uh, we we find these unique ideas, and I think what's great about it is that they're just everywhere. You know, they're they're always around, and often writers are struggling. And they're like, how can I write the screenplay that's going to be picked up? How can I write a screenplay that's going to be unique and fresh and I mean, I've read a lot of scripts in my life. I've been a script reader a lot, and you know, you're waiting for that moment where something pops. And you're on the page and you're like, whoa, wait, what is this? And when we do these kind of exercises, we're just always popping. And ideas are just always coming and they're always there. And the idea with the book is that I'm I'm really hoping that people cannot be stuck anymore. Because I think writers, we get stuck. You know, mm-hmm. there's so much we're facing. We're so much we're facing. We're facing the infinity, but we're also facing all the pressure of the industry. You know, is this thing going to make money? Is it, you know, am I going to get, you know, is it going to work? And and so people can get really stuck. And the idea with the wells is people can just tap into them and they can dig them deeper. That's the other thing. So the second part of the book, once you've identified these wells, is you can dig them deeper in a, in a really, I mean, just to give you a really simple idea, mm-hmm. to your external sources well, you dig deeper by either reading more scripts or watching more movies. Mm-hmm. Simple. Easiest yeah. well to dig deeper. But obviously you watch movies that are interesting to you and unique to you, and then your, your, your well becomes unique. Mm-hmm. Um, the imagination well, you do a lot of play, you do a lot of reading, you read up about Da Vinci, you, you, know, you, you, kind of, um, you just kind of open yourself up to this, this imagination, and bam, you can dig it deeper. And then your memory well, well, there's a lot of exercises in the book, which I won't really get into, but there's a lot of exercises around your, your fears, your your happiness, your happiest memory, your saddest memory. Spend some time digging into your past and see what what lies there, because there's probably gems there with everyone. Isn't it funny that um, Luis uh, Luis Manuel um, uh, Luis Manuel from uh, Napo- uh, Napoleon um, Hamilton, who wrote oh, yeah, Ham- yeah. who wrote Hamilton? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, who in God's green earth would have thought that a book about Hamilton, uh, you know, would do would be a worldwide yep. phenomenon as it was. Yep. And he took yep. from his own experience as an immigrant, his father, and he actually mm-hmm. tells his father, that's his father's story. 
coming wow. from Puerto Rico, and Incredible. then he just put Incredible. it all together through hip hop and mix, and he just literally collided a thousand things. Absolutely. And when you watch it, you're just like, well, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen in my life. It's just, yeah. just it's just yeah. such a. You want to talk about unique? I mean, and there was no Absolutely. on paper. It does not make sense. Like, yeah. It, yeah. It, it doesn't make sense. And if you don't know, if the, the best story is when it was first introduced, it was at the uh, at the Obama White House where he mm -hmm. was invited to do uh, uh, like a uh, talk poetry. What did that talk? Was that yeah, yeah. When they, no, uh, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah like like uh, uh, spoken word. Spoke, stuff, yeah, 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 spoken word. Yeah, spoken word poetry. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he's like, listen, I would like to do this little rap I did on on Hamilton. And Obama goes, well, good luck with that. <laughs> and when <laughs> he says, like, well, good luck. Because it doesn't sound like, I mean, come on. Who, yeah. Who's going to listen yeah. to a rap about Hamilton? Yeah. And it just exploded. And when you, and you saw it, when I saw it, because you see it on YouTube. You could see it on YouTube yeah. that moment. And you could see yeah. everybody in the room just, just, wow. ex That's just, amazing. you just, oh my God. And when, and when you, and it's, it's really digging into these kind of wells where he dealt, he digged into his external, he digged into his imagination, he digged into his memory and combined yeah. them. And I think if you are able to combine these wells, uh, you have something extremely unique. And something else you said earlier, which I want to touch on, is, you know, there's a lot of pressures on writers and was it going to make money and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I feel that, and I'm, I would love to hear, get your point of view on this, is, is yeah. writers, if you ask the, the question, is this going to make money, you're dead in the water. <laughs> ha you, you're, I mean, you, you can't, I yeah. mean, unless you're being hired to write something for a studio mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. $100 million, yeah. that's a different ball game. And even then you shouldn't yeah. think, is it going to make money? You should, yeah. what is it going to be in service of the story? What can I do? To, you know, that's how that's how certain movies in the studio systems kind of sneak through, like like uh -huh. like the whole Batman trilogy that Nolan did. Yeah, yeah. You know, they all made a lot of money, but boy, did he sneak yep. in a bunch of stuff yep. that normally is not Absolutely. in a studio movie. Absolutely. So would you, would you yeah, agree yeah, with yeah. that? Oh, sorry, was that? Would you would you agree with that in regards to like asking oh, yeah, a proper yeah, yeah, question? Yeah. Definitely, definitely. Um, I think it's sorry, it's breaking up a little bit. No worries. That's can you hear me? I can hear you okay, perfectly. Cool. Uh, oh, fantastic. Okay, cool. No, I just heard some. You know, anyway, it's uh, so so. Yeah, I think I would agree with it a hundred percent. And actually, one of the things in my book is that I'm hoping that writers can write stories that kind of really matter to them, and they don't have to think about like, oh, is this going to make money? Because ah, look, okay, this is a really big aim, but I've got a feeling you may have similar aims is that I feel that a lot of the stories, especially feature films that we're seeing nowadays, not all of them, but a lot of them are just like, you know, the next, let's make the next, um, look, I love the Marvel movies, but, you know, let's make the next Marvel movie, let's make the next thing. And people are, don't always kind of, they're scared of walking on a limb and telling something that matters to them. And these stories that we create are quite fragile. Mm -hmm. And and often these stories, the fragile stories, are the ones that I'm hoping that the book will help tell. Because we all have these stories that come to us sometimes. And they're like these little golden chickens that come and they're like, yeah, we've got to tell you. we've got to, And we've got to kind of make this little chicken grow. And it's this kind of fragile thing that we create. And then we kind of, you know, we're, we're afraid that... As soon as you start, like you said, as soon as you start thinking about money, it's, you know, is this going to make money? Is this going to, you're already in service of something else. You're not in service of what the Hamilton guy was in service of mm -hmm. when he wanted to make Hamilton. That was something totally different. I don't think at any point he was like, is this going to make money? Because if he really thought that, he probably would have gone no and he would have stopped, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> it was so crazy. Right. But he was, he was in service of something else. And this is kind of what I'm hoping uh, the book will help is is people who are in service of these stories that matter to them mm -hmm. and that matter to the world. That's the other thing about the about the Hamilton stories was so timeless because he was resonating with his own truth in that moment. And bam, there it was. And it was so timeless. It was just kind of kind of kind of perfect. Yeah. So I, so it's a long kind of answer to your question. Mm -hmm. But um, I but I do think that um, that, yeah, it's it's not you can't ask, is it going to make money? It's just going to. It's gonna kill you. You're done. It's, it's, there's something else. Yeah, you're done. You're done. You're done. <laughs> it's, you're, back, you're, you know. I think you're putting too much pressure on the um, on the actual art. If you yeah. if if you cannot allow the art uh, to grow and be what it's gonna be, um, yeah. to a certain extent. Look, if someone gives me two hundred million dollars, I'm not gonna just like, hey, let's figure it out. Let, no, 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 I'm not course. that. There's a resp no. There's a physical responsibility. But at yes, the end absolutely. of the day. If you are honest to the story, you are in service of the story and what you're trying to do, money comes regardless yep. of what you're trying to do. Yep. Uh, w without question, I feel so many filmmakers and screenwriters put so much pressure on the art. 
like this is the script yeah. that's going to blow me up. This is the this is the movie <laughs> that's going to take get me that agent yeah. that I've been wanting. No. You can't yeah. do that. And but but because no. I've been I, I talk to so many filmmakers and I see so many screenwriters and I and I and I see the guys who succeed and the girls who succeed, mm. and none of them ask the question: Is this going to be making money? They did it just because. Yeah. They did. They wanted to do it, and and that's where you need to. And it's Absolutely. hard to be there. It's hard to get there. It really is. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's really difficult. I mean, I yeah, it's really really difficult. And I think it's like you know, it, like you said, it's not like oh fragile. Oh, I'm an artist. It's actually the, almost the opposite of that. It's like it's like I'm working hard at these wells. I'm digging in them all the time. I'm making them available. And here's my ideas. And here's my script. And it's great. And I love it. Oh, and here's another one. You know, and let's, let's do this one. And it's kind of like constantly working at being freer and loosening yourself up so that these stories come and that you can kind of keep on doing them in a way mm -hmm. because yeah otherwise it's just you know it's this one script that you're holding on to for dear life and hoping it's for, ten, for 10 years <laughs> yeah yeah anytime i see i yeah. meet a screenwriter he's like how many scripts have you written he's like oh i've got this one and i'm like is that it and he's like yeah that's the one i'm like yeah yeah that's the yeah that's that's yeah. that's a rough that's yeah I, yeah you've got I, yeah. you're basically I've been there. telling I've been you, there. yeah so have I, I mean yeah I've had, I've had that yeah. one short film I've had that yeah. one script yeah, yeah. and it's like yeah. then you're telling me you only want one swing at the bat when you yeah. go up to base exactly. you've got exactly. one swing and that's it yeah you yeah. got no other swings I think you know <laughs> if there's one thing that, that I think your your podcast also communicate really clearly is it's not one swing at a bat no ways man you got to stand up there you got to hit that ball constantly and then when you when you're really exhausted and tired and you think you can't hit this ball anymore and you want to give up but you still want to hit it then you know that you're a baseball player or a screenwriter you know exactly. if, you say, if you know you if you know you still want to write the story i mean i've had you know i've written quite a lot of features and i've written a lot of television and i keep thinking to myself when is this going to end you know <laughs> but the but the stories keep coming because and, and yeah. i do want to keep telling them mm -hmm. and that's and that's a you wonderful know? that's a wonderful place to be now i want to yeah. also talk to you about cuz i think this i think your book really touches upon this is authenticity authenticity yes. as a writer um, and how, and I would love to hear what you think of how writers can be more consciously write more authentically, yes. as opposed to only l digging into the external well, which a lot of writers do. They just rehash old stuff Absolutely. that they've seen again and again and yeah. again, yeah. where I think the combination of the three and that, and because when you watch mm -hmm. a movie, that's authentic, you know, you yep. watch something that just comes from a place you that you it, could man. just feel it. That, it, that the, the writer, the Absolutely. director, you know, you watch Schindler's List and you go, yeah. well, that's Spielberg doing what he – like that is really personal. Absolutely. It just oozes yeah. off the Absolutely. screen. Absolutely. Um, so Absolutely. So what's, what's your thoughts on that? So my thoughts on that are, are that, you know, when I when I started teaching writing sort of about 20 years ago, I've been teaching this. And a lot of people when they first start writing their scripts – I don't know why, but I mean, I guess I did it too, actually, probably, is like, you know, I'm going to write a story about a prostitute who meets a gangster, and then they're in, you know, and, and you know, I'm in South Africa, so, but in New York, and I'm like, I know nothing about New York, I know nothing about <laughs> prostitutes or gangsters, right? Um, and, but yet, I'm going to write this thing, and then, so what I do is I draw from the external source as well, so I get this half-remembered idea of a prostitute from, like, pretty woman, and then this half-remembered idea of gangsters from, like, good fellas, and then, like, I kind of of what I know of New York and it just you know it's thin it's really thin yeah, yeah, and yeah. you know you can structure it perfectly mm -hmm. um, you could even make characters that are kind of okay but it's lacking something and this is this authenticity thing it's just lacking depth mm -hmm. and so I, I always thought to myself how am I going to teach this to students how am I going to teach people to like get depth <laughs> you know yeah. is it something you're just born with or what is it and so what I realized is I, I used to do these exercises with him. And this is kind of where the memory thing came from. I used to do this exercise where I was like, okay, so in your life, there's been one moment where everything's changed. The one moment, something happened in your life where everything changed. And students started, and they started looking at their lives and they'd go back and they'd go, okay, oh yeah, there was that time I was mugged. Yeah, that wasn't so nice. Um, or it could be anything like, there was that one moment when I realized my grandmother was going to die. Mm -hmm. And I was visiting her in the old age home and I knew she was going to die and she was getting dementia. And that moment was when everything changed. And I get them to write that into a script. Mm -hmm. And what they started writing were these amazing things that were just full of so much authenticity. It was like, okay, so I was mugged. 
but it was kind of funny the way the mugging happened. And it happened in this random place that you wouldn't think that like, you know, outside a train station, people were walking by and this guy was mugging me and no one was doing anything. And he was just holding this knife out at me, just showing me the knife. He wasn't like threatening me. All he did was show me the knife. And I'm like, ooh. That just suddenly it was a lot more authentic than someone taking out a gun and going, I'm mugging you now. You know, right, yeah. What, on know, the nose, very on the like, nose. Yeah, very on the nose. It was just like, I've got a knife. What are you going to do? Um, and, and you know, the old timers thing was like, you know, she opens the fridge and something in the fridge has gone moldy and everything in the fridge is moldy. So she hasn't, you know, grandmother hasn't been in the fridge for a while. She's losing it. And that moment had such authenticity. And then the students would write these scenes and I remember, I'll never forget when, when the scenes are read, I make my students read out in the class, you know, so mm -hmm. you read out your scripts because you can suddenly hear what it feels like mm -hmm. or, and what it sounds like. And I'll never forget that moment after that class. The room was vibrating with this authentic energy and, and people were crying and people were laughing mm -hmm. and people were, oh man, it was like colors were popping. It was just fantastic. I actually, I had to go lie outside on the ground. And like I lay on a bench and I just watched the clouds drift by because it was just... It was this great moment of like, okay, this is authentic, authentic. I'm sorry, authentic, authentic, authentic. authentic yeah. yeah. And so I, so I kind of in the book, I, I kind of, um, that's why I, I, I kind of draw so heavily on the memory well. That's where the true stuff lies, and I almost, you know, some people can write really imaginative stuff and it can be really, really fun. But if you link it up to your, to your memories in some ways, man, you've got. That, that's the way you get the authenticity. I really think that's the way the, the authenticity comes about. And what's interesting as well, just from a, a writing point of view, is it's happening in television writing in some ways now. Like a lot of the TV series have got this like, ah, it's really kind of real. Either because of the research, because this is the other thing. Because of that story I was talking about in New York, if I actually went to New York and kind of researched and walked around the streets and, and, and New York entered my memory well, I could have written with a lot more authenticity. Mm -hmm. You know, I always use the example of like The Wire, you know, the TV series The Wire. It's like it just had so much authenticity because those guys lived the life. You know, they were there. Yeah. They were journalists. They reported on it. The, you know, the guy was, you know, literally the guy who, who you know, was the homicide division. He'd, he'd been there. He knew that that space so well. It seeps with authenticity because the writers have activated all their five senses and they've lived those moments. So the idea, I think, with real authenticity is to live the moments and then put them in your script and be brave enough to to put those moments in your script and to slow down in that moment of creativity and go, wait a minute. You can even revisit scripts you've written already and you can go back and you can look at the scene and say, OK, so I wrote this breakup scene and I said it in the bedroom because that's where people break up <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and, and look back at your own life and say, where, where, where did I break up with people? Okay, wait a minute. It was actually a sushi restaurant <laughs> or I don't know. It was like, you know, on the side of the road in the car. Oh, yeah. It was in the shopping mall in the in the, you know, in the in the parking in the shopping mall in the parking lot. Oh, yeah. And then you change the breakup scene from the bedroom to the parking lot. And suddenly you've got something that's fresh and unique and original. And so that's the way that you can also use the wells. And I talk about it in like locations, like changing your locations, mm -hmm. sort of locations from life. And then, and then chopping your scene around, and then suddenly what happens is your script suddenly pops all these fresh, kind of unique, authentic, I mean, authentic, I keep saying authentic, <laughs> that's not anyway, these authentic locations, yeah. No, it's 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 funny as you're talking, and I and I, I just, you know, I just did a movie um, that I shot at the Sundance Film Festival, and that film is, mm -hmm. is my, uh, many, many of my stories are in it. Of like, you know, it's about filmmakers yeah. trying to sell their movie at Sundance. No one had ever done it before. And I was like, but I've been to Sundance eight or nine times. So I know the layout of Park City, <laughs> like the back yeah. of my head. So when I was writing it and putting it together, I'm like, oh, yeah, we'll go over to this restaurant. We'll go over to that restaurant. We'll go into here. Uh -huh. We got to take this nice. trip over there. Nice. And then and they're like, oh, that one that one Sundance I went where I was completely depressed and didn't even know where I was going to go in my life. And I walked down Main Street at three o'clock in the morning and I looked like a back lot. We, should, we put that scene in and you can sense wow. that kind of stuff coming off the screen. Amazing. It's one of the, Amazing. it's one of the things yeah, I yeah. love that I've done and, and ever because of that authenticity of it, because it was, yep, yep. it was authentic to my story, but also so many stories I'd heard before from other filmmakers yeah. that I've met or yeah, have dealt yeah. with in my life. Yeah. But that's yeah. what makes yeah. those kind of stories so unique because, and I think you're right. The memory. Well, it is the, it's kind of like the secret stuff. It's the stuff it that is. nobody, it it's is. the thing that it puts is. you apart from the billion of other screenwriters out there trying to get a story Absolutely. told. Absolutely. Because just like we did Absolutely. in the earlier exercise, 
I don't know of anybody else, or at least I've never seen it or heard about it, of no. the sound of that no. co coffin on a plastic tray being drawn into a – that's something that's very uniquely mine until now, and now someone Absolutely. will steal it from me. But that's And that's fine. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Um, but, but that's yeah. something extremely uniquely my story, my memory. And if we could even just dabble that stuff on – you know, a Stephen King book. Like, I mean, Stephen King puts out books yeah. left and right, but yeah, I'm, exactly. I, I promise yeah. you, Stephen King probably has pulled a lot. Like, when he wrote Carrie or he wrote The Definitely. Shining, there's Definitely. things about yeah. his family, his life, his, you know, all that stuff that's Definitely. drizzled in there. Definitely. And what's interesting is that writers do it um, almost unconsciously. You know, the good writers just, I don't know why, they just do it automatically. They just draw from their life. They, they just draw from their memories. It's a great process, and it's quite a liberating process. And it's actually quite a fun process. And, I mean, I may even go so far as to say it's a transformative process. Because, mm -hmm. you know, we can write, you know, from the imagination well, we can write from the memory, I mean, from the external sources well. It's already fun, and it's light, and it's fun. But when you start writing from your own stuff and putting some of your own stuff in there, it becomes transformative, not just as a writer, but as a human being. So I find that if people write with some of their own stuff in there, first of all, the scripts are great, much better, stories are better, characters are more interesting, but the writer's experience of writing is better. Mm -hmm. It's quite amazing. If you kind of write the stuff that you is somehow linked to you in some way, it's just it's transformative. It's almost therapeutic. I mean, I'm not a therapist. I wouldn't say I am, but you know, it it's it is. like it's a little therapeutic. Yeah. No, there, yeah. there there's and, there's no question. You exercise some demons when you do that. Totally, absolutely, you do. <laughs> there's a great quote in the book about something about exercising your divine discontent or something. It's in the book, one of the quotes from another writer, and it's just it's great. You do you exercise some de exercise some demons. Yeah. And and again, it is that secret stuff. So people listening, you know, out there, you know, if you're able to pull from your own memories uh, and and incorporate them in a creative environment uh, and cre a creative story, yeah, that is what's going to stick you apart from everybody else. And if you if you're just if Absolutely. you're just making that prostitute, pretty woman, Goodfellas <laughs> gangster in New York, which you've yeah. never stepped foot in New York, chances yeah. are, even if you know structure extremely well, even if you know character development yep. really well, it's going to mm -hmm. be like you said, very thin, but yeah, something's a missing. But a first-time writer who lived New York. Well, that's why Martin Scorsese's movies were so amazing, exactly. like Mean Streets and and Taxi yeah. Driver. Oh man, he lived Raging Bull. All Raging of those, Bull. Yeah. He lived New York. He understood the gangster lifestyle because he Absolutely. met the guys he hung out with. You know? Yeah, yeah totally, totally. Yeah, it's it's remarkable. And now, go ahead. And it's the same as you know. What's interesting though is so Woody Allen. Is also New York, totally different guy, like totally same city, totally different experience mm -hmm. because their memories of it is so different. Their experiences are so different that you have these totally, they both feel they're totally, totally different because their memories are different of, of these places. And then, but they both have authenticity, which is, you know, which is also yeah. very interesting. That's a really good point that they have both are known for their New York work. Yeah. And they're both yeah. so different. <laughs> it's so, so radically different, different experiences. So, totally, absolutely different. Could you imagine just swapping those two in their life? It just like Mars Scorsese's just... living Woody Allen. <laughs> now that would be an interesting movie. And Woody Allen's the gangster. Allen's... Yeah. 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 <laughs> that would be great. That would be yeah. amazing. Woody Allen character walks into a Martin Scorsese movie, oh, you know, and suddenly God. he's like, oh, hey, sorry. You know, what did I do? How am I a clown? Well, you're a clown because... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, I this, think it'll be a really short movie. It would be a very, it's like, a short bam, film. Bam, the end, the end. It's a yeah. short film, obviously. Um, now, there's a couple. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about is subtext. Um, it's something that that writers uh, and directors and filmmakers they forget about. Do you have any tips on how to, we can add some really nice subtext to our stories? I do actually. So subtext for me is. Again, I do. I talk about it in the book briefly as well. Is that when we? So I'm going to talk about the breakup scene mm -hmm. um, because I kind of. It's one of these. You know, our lives peppered, and if you look back through our memories, there are these certain blips that happen, and and breakups and deaths and mm -hmm. you know angry moments are, are things that kind of pop up. So so the breakup scene I kind of use as an example. Often when, when someone has to write a breakup scene, so your job as a writer is very often like, okay, this guy has to break up with this girl in order for the plot to move forward, so I've got to write a breakup scene. Mm -hmm. So you're not really, you know, it's not the kind of central reason why you're writing the movie, but for the plot to move forward, you've got to write a breakup scene. So you go, okay, 
they're in bed and uh, one of them gets up and says something like, um, you know, I've always loved you, but I think it's time we end it. <laughs> okay, whatever. What? And the other one says, <laughs> right. you know, it's like, it's like uh, okay, well, if you do really, no, no, please don't leave me or whatever. You know, these, I'm just drawing the first thing that comes to mind and the dialogue is really on the nose. And it's, and, and it's like, you know, but you're getting the scene written. So you're writing and it's feeling like, okay, cool. I'm writing a breakup scene. And like structurally you've written a breakup scene, but there's no subtext. It's all on the nose dialogue. It's all exactly what, you know, kind of anyone could could write. But if you take a moment to think about, wait a minute, when did I break up with someone? What did I actually say? Yeah. What words were used? Yeah. I'm going back to my own breakups in my head. <laughs> As you're saying this, I'm like, we were, we didn't actually say what we meant. We said other that things. Never, totally. You would never, you know, you don't want to hurt the person's feeling. You, you don't want to say like, so you, you get up and you say like, <laughs> I don't even know what you say. I'm trying to No, no, it's just like it's well. it's not you, it's me. It's you know, but like, you mm -hmm. know, but you never like I remember my one of my breakups and I didn't even know it came. And it was like in the in like like yeah. literally an hour prior to the breakup, everything was fine. But underneath all of it, it was her about to break up with me. And she and I it just was brought broadsided me because I couldn't yeah. read the subtext of her for obviously for months, um, yep. Yep. <laughs> of what she was doing. <laughs> obviously for months, yeah. I didn't see what was going on, uh, and, she, and her discontent yeah. with our relationship at the time. Um, but you're right; it was never on the yep. nose. If you do a breakup, it's no. never on the nose. It's never something that no. I'm breaking up with you because you uh, leave the dishes out all the time. You don't make the bed, <laughs> and you're horrible in the sack. Like you never hear yeah. that. <laughs> It's never, not, never. No. But you, but I see it in scripts, first time scripts all the time, in first drafts. You're like, you know, this is just, whoa, what are you doing? And then, you know, you know, where you hear it, and, and often, you know, you, the breakup happens with a look, yeah, or, or like a moment where, or somebody brings you a cup of tea every morning, and one morning, they don't, and it's you look at them, or they bring it, and they just put it down, and you look, and there's that one look, and and you say, love you, and someone says, turns away, and you're like, what the fuck? You know, where's the where's the response? And and so for me, the subtext is and I and, and this is again one of these things I wanted to teach writers. How do I teach subtext? I don't know, but we live it all the time. You know, we're constantly decoding the world as human beings. We're looking at each other's faces, we're constantly reading the subtext all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, the guy who's serving you your coffee at the Starbucks, you're looking at the subtext, you're realizing this guy's had a shitty day, and your mind you're kind of reading into everything all the time. And that is what writers need to write in their scripts, is writing that stuff that we we kind of con and, and when you then <laughs> When you see that on the screen, you're like, ah, oh, she's going to break up with him. You know it already mm -hmm. because it's all in the subtext. And I think that's that, that's my main advice is like write from life, write from what you've seen in life. And then look at your script and go, is this realistic to my own life? Has this you know, And then go to your memory wall and say, hmm, can I draw from something else from there? Is there another way of saying this? And I'd say, yeah, that's that's the thing for me with subtext is it's it's obviously not writing on the nose, but it's a lot more about what is unsaid. And, you know, one of the kind of I said, this isn't in the book, but because it's kind of one of the kind of more obvious things is like just if you can show it without saying it, then that's going to be, you know, that's going to be the best that especially with subtext, you know, it's, it's like, you know, and, and never people never say what they mean. I mean, it's, you know, it's like you say, you know, no never. one says I'm, I'm breaking up with you because you, you know, you you don't clean the dishes. Yes, yeah. never, never, ever happens. No, it does. it's always something else. It's always something else. Yeah. And they I mean, always you're right. And we are constantly decoding human behavior on a daily basis. But for whatever reason, when we write for the first time, you forget that. And you're so on the nose. Yeah. And it took me a long time to realize what on the nose meant. Yeah. Like, yeah. just yeah. like, because yeah. I would, my first scripts were like, I got notes back or I got coverage on it. And they're like, yeah. your dialogue's on the nose. And I'm like, yep. I get, I understand the concept. But I'm like, what do you mean? I'm, I'm, yeah. He's going from point A to point B. He's talking about point A to point B. Yeah. And I'm yeah. like, that, that's just the way the story's moving forward. I don't understand yep. why it's not yep. working. And then all of a sudden, yep. something clicks and go, Dude, it's not about A to B. It's about Y to Z. 
and then you got to <laughs> write about Y to Z while you're doing A yeah. to B. There you got and, something. Oh, yep. And I probably, confused, and I probably have confused, and I probably confused more people listening now than before. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a really confusing thing. And actually, as writers, we are facing this dilemma because we're not just writing dialogue that happened in life. This is the other thing. We're not, and I talk about it in the book as well. I'm not expecting you to write your breakup scene. That's going to be boring. I'm sorry. It probably is, you know, it's really important to you. But, you know, out of context, if you write a breakup scene um, from life, it's going to be boring. We, we as writers have to also move the plot forward. So we're doing two things. We, we're moving the plot forward with our dialogue. So we're delivering information that has to do with the plot. And then we're also trying to keep it real, like people speak in real life. And that balance, I think that's where people struggle a lot because we do have to move the plot forward. They have to break up by the end of the scene. You have to communicate to the audience. They have broken up. They, someone might have to say, so we're we breaking up. Yeah. Okay. That might have to be in there somewhere. But you don't put that in all the time. So that, that's the balance that we've got to face as writers, keeping it real, keeping the dialogue real, but then moving the plot forward. And very often people just move the plot forward and then they stop keeping it real. And that's the balance. It is difficult. And I think it's one of the most difficult things. I think it's kind of it's a really tricky question about subtext and why you're, you're, you're reverting to things like A to B and Y to Z because it becomes quite abstract in a way. And actually, that's a lot of what writing is. It's really abstract. And screenwriting, even though it's a craft, no doubt, and there are a lot of books out there that tell you about, you know, if you plot from X to Y and A to B and then there's the graphs and diagrams and all these things. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, yeah, okay. But in truth, no one really knows anything and and you've got to just it's a fragile beast we're dealing with here this creativity especially in screenwriting and this is what i think is why my book is slightly different to the other stuff is that it deals with the creative process in the moment when you're creating and so it's it's that kind of um it's that kind of subtle and and often language fails us at this point language fails us and it becomes art again and it's quite exciting in a way, mm -hmm. even though, you know, I'm telling your view, your view is now going, what the hell are these guys talking about? Just tell me how to do it. And I'm saying, it's yes, not, there are ways. It's not that easy. It's not, man. Yeah. It's not. And, and look, structure is structure. You can you could do a three act structure. You could do a five act structure. Yeah. You could do, you know, and, and that's easy to learn. I mean, that's yeah. not hard to learn a three act structure. They tell you yeah. they literally are on. You could Google the hero's journey. Yep. You could Google Absolutely. a three act structure and like, okay, yep. from this page, yep. this page should have something like this happen at this yep. page. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, it's just that, that's a roadmap, but Absolutely. what, yep. but how to fill that and how to get mm -hmm. to that point. Cause it's, uh, eventually you just will instinctually know the structure. Uh, yes. You will get to the point yes. where structure is not going to be an issue for you anymore. If you outline Absolutely. your things, right. Absolutely. It's all this other Got stuff it. that makes it really good. Yep. You know, it's, it's, it's like those early playwrights, you know, you think of Tom Stoppard and these guys, I don't know, like, you know, these, um, they, the names just came for these early that playwrights Shakespeare in the guy. 80s. That Shakespeare guy. Yeah, well, <laughs> no, 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 he's too early, he's too early. I've never, anyway, Shakespeare's another story. But, uh, uh -huh. <laughs> but like those guys who are grappling with life and their experiences and they're putting it on the screen, like Scorsese is, it does it as well, of course, but it's, but it's that kind of stuff. How do you get that stuff onto this on, onto the script? And that's kind of what drawing from these wells are is about in some way. But drawing from life and struggling with it, you know, and but yeah, keeping it real at the same time. So yeah. Now, now yeah. do you have any advice on how to create memorable characters? I'd love to hear your uh, thought about I that. Do. I do actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So creating memorable characters is. Again, there's also a section in the book, and I'll use the wells as a way of of talking about it um, because. First of all, you can draw characters from, if, if we use the wells, your external source as well. So you can say, okay, well, I'm going to do a character that's just like Rocky. You know, you could. Or I'm going to do a character that's just like Luke Skywalker. Mm -hmm. Or you could do your imagination well. You could do a bit of Harry Potter kind of where, where um, uh, J.K. Rowling was sitting in the train. Harry Potter came to her like Zam, lightning bolt from above. A lot of the characters just came to her out of the blue. And you can, or you can, you can take like, uh, if you want to create a memorable character, you could take like Rocky meets Harry Potter and collide the characters together. Now you've got the, the Rocky Harry Potter character. I don't know what that is. I don't know what that genius. Be. But, a boxer wizard. A boxer a wizard. Boxer. Oh my God, we've got Shark, yeah. Sharknado. I'm telling you, Sharknado, yeah. it will work. Yeah, exactly. It's in my book. You, you again, you're ahead. It's like Sharknado. It's like a tornado and sharks. Bam. Okay. So but you can brilliant. do the same with characters. You know, you, that's what they did. That's I know. That's exactly what they did. What it's can crazy. we throw together? I love it. Yeah, it's great. I love it. And then, you know, but 
people do this all the time. They, so one of the shows I wrote a long time ago was like, okay, so we got a, okay, in South Africa it was rugby, in America it's American football. So you got an American football player and someone who's really camp, collide them together and you've got this camp American football player. Interesting. He has a character that's kind of unique. That's using the imagination well. But memory well, man, that's where the unique characters lie. Like oh, no doubt about it. Oh yeah. I've got a whole, I've, I've got this whole system in the book where you, you go through your character list, even in the script that you've written, and you've written, say, say you've written a character. So I wrote this scene in a script that I'd written, and I had a scene that was a music store guy working like a clerk in a music store. Sure, okay. Sure. He was just, he was music store clerk one or something like mm -hmm. that in the script, right? He was random, and he had some dialogue, but he wasn't really unique. And then I went through my life and I looked through all the people that I knew and I went almost like a Rolodex through my life. And I was like, okay, this is, he was quite interesting. Yeah, this guy was quite interesting. And then I found this guy who was like a goth, okay, like a long haired, you know, depressed goth, right? Uh, tattooed everywhere, piercings everywhere. And I was like, wait a minute, put him in the music store. And suddenly I had this character that was like really memorable, like not really wanting to work in the store right, and like long haired goth, sure, you know. Sure. And, and, and my, my main, one of my main characters was there and she was a young mother and she had this baby in her arms and she was trying to get her CDs that she was trying to sell out of her bag and she was like and she kind of handed the baby to the goth and now this goth like holds this baby and he's like I'm sorry madam this is not cus this is not uh, this is not policy in the store and you know he's like holding babies or accepting her CDs we couldn't really tell but it became quite a memorable and interesting scene that left off the page because I was drawing from characters in my life and we see them all the time I mean I bet you if your readers and, and, or your listeners and, and even yourself just thought back to today, and if you know if you've left the house, <laughs> and you think about who've I bumped into today, it's like, oh yeah, there was this Uber driver. He was really weird. Now, what happens if that Uber driver and we take him and you put him in a script in in a in a character in your script, and that's the way I find really memorable characters come from, because they're everywhere in life. Yep. But we don't open our eyes. And and one of the things that I really am calling for with this book is that we open our eyes a bit more and get off the, you know, look, my cell phone's right here, but like, you know, get off the cell phone and look around us and open our eyes again and like see the world and see the characters that are around all the time and then draw from that. And look, it's a cliche, but you know, if you're the friend of a writer, he's probably going to write about you. <laughs> so, you know, no, no, there's like, no question. Where the characters come from. They come from my life. You know, that's it. It's like, you know, I'm sorry. I'm writing about you. That's it. <laughs> oh, no, there's there's no, there's absolutely no question. I've done that m multiple times in my life where I called up my friend. I'm like, look, dude, um, you're in, you're in the movie. <laughs> you're in the movie. Like, really? He's like, uh, not only are you in the movie, your name, I'm, I'm not even going to be that creative. Your, your name is in the movie. Um, and yeah, I'm yeah. going to take elements of your life. I'm going to mix it with somebody else, but... You're gonna see yourself yep. up there. Sorry, and yeah. that's, that's the way it is. It's kind. Of, it's kind of what people do naturally, but I think very often when you're writing to a deadline or we're writing with some pressure, we we kind of forget that that's what we're doing, and and so we forget to kind of draw from life and draw from the characters from life. And you go, oh yeah. So yeah, that that would be my way of creating memorable characters. And it's, you know. But what's great as well about about the three wells is when you combine all three. So okay, you've got the goth, and then you've got uh, someone from another movie. So uh, I don't know why we're thinking of. I'm thinking of like the guy from Bringing Out the Dead because I'm thinking of Martin Scorsese now. I'm mm -hmm. thinking of the taxi driver, um, Nicolas Cage's character, mm -hmm. and the goth combined together. And now you've got some sort of a. I don't know, a goth paramedic. Okay, cool. Wait a minute. Goth paramedic <laughs> who's saying. drugged up on some stuff, so he's high. There we go. And now you've and got now a now really now interesting character. Now you've got something going there. There's something going there. And, and so, yeah, so that's how you do it. And if you combine all three wells, then we're really cooking with gas. That's the way to, you know, that's the way to really do it. And, and, and another thing you, always talk, you, you talked about a couple times here is colliding. Colliding yeah. ideas, colliding characters, colliding stories. Can you just yep. touch on, on that a little bit more? Because I think it's so powerful. Like we just did it with Rocky and Harry Potter. <laughs> I don't know what that character would be, but that could be the germ to start something bigger. You know, it could be the yep. genesis of another yep. character where, you know, yep. all of a sudden Harry Potter learns how to fight and he's also a wizard. So MMA, MMA, Harry Potter? Yeah, like maybe, why, totally, totally why not? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But he wrestles oh, dragons yeah. instead, so he fights dragons physically. Yeah. But you see, uh, now you see it's going. It's going. Okay. 
That's no. the imagination. I love it. The imagination was just going, and this is what happens with colliding ideas. So the idea is, it's, it's almost like a like a physics thing. You know, you've got these two atoms, and they collide together. And as they collide, they spark. And it's that spark that just gets ideas going and gets the creative juices flowing. And then you can create something that's just, it's quite unbelievable once that spark happens. But if you're just sitting there with the one idea and the other idea, and you don't collide them together, you don't, you know, you don't create something. It's actually, I mean, it goes back to the sort of idea of, um, What's it? Um, thesis and antithesis create together. You create synthesis. Mm -hmm. There's this kind of you know deep theory of this, which is kind of it's very academic. But um, but the idea is that when you collide two almost opposites together, it's a mm -hmm. bit of, a bit like juxtaposition. You spark off something that is then the imagination world. That's I call it like a geezer. It it like spurts out, and it's like oh my, you can't stop it. I mean this Harry Potter Rocky thing. I don't know. I'm probably never going to forget it. And who knows where it's going to end up one day. But you know yeah. it's it's like it's like they they're totally random. But but you collide them, and then you've got this. And what happens is. It's, then it becomes not just a character, but a story. Because you started plotting earlier. You weren't even talking about the character. You were plotting a whole story with MMA and dragons. He's got to fight the dragons. And, <laughs> and so what happens is like suddenly the plot starts coming from these characters that we've collided together. And that's That can be really, really powerful. That is. Yeah. It, well, that was how like Indiana Jones was created. Like an archaeologist yeah. who goes around the world getting the, okay. like, oh, you know, Absolutely. whip wielding. That was literally Spielberg and Lucas on a beach. Yeah, and they totally. were just like, hey, right. why don't we make a movie about an archaeologist who goes around treasure hunting? You know, like, wouldn't that be cool? And, and he's got a whip and a fedora. And, there, yeah, yeah. and from there, the rest was born. Exactly. Exactly. It, yeah. It's pretty It's pretty insane. Um, now, I'm going to ask you a few questions I ask all of my guests. Oh, um, yeah, I'm terrified. I know, I know what's coming. So, uh, right, so, pre so prepare yourself. <laughs> Um, okay. but, but before we do that, you actually told me yeah, a, yeah, a, an amazing uh, – and it's a, a humbling story – uh about how you heard about me and i'm not yeah. I, and i want to just i just i'd love for you to tell the story on air because okay. it's just something that was i've never had that happen to me so i think it's a really cool idea yeah a really cool okay, story yeah, so yeah. if you could tell me that would be awesome i love it okay I, i'm gonna draw from my memory well and tell you a story about <laughs> what happened. so I, I live in a place called musenberg which is a Basically like Venice Beach in Cape Town in South Africa, except much smaller, um, but it's kind of wide streets, lots of skateboarders, lots of surfers. And there was this coffee shop that I sometimes work at. And I'm working there, working on, on some courses from the book. And I see this guy next to me and he's got a laptop open and it's got a, you know, it's got an editing suite on. So it's got like Premiere, uh, something he's editing something. And, you know, which is probably also a bit like Venice Beach on LA. It's everyone just always working on scripts or movies or mm -hmm. like, it's everywhere. And uh, so he's working on this thing. And I say to him, uh, hey, how's it going? You know, because I always want to meet people. That's the other thing. I'm always just meeting people. It's, it's really good advice, by the way. It's like meet people all the time. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you, so I approach this guy and I say like, oh, you're doing some edit work. What are you working on? And he's a still photographer who's moving into video and we start talking. And I say, I've got this book. And he goes, oh, it's amazing. Come take a picture, Instagram. He Instagrammed me with the book. And then he, I, I said that I've also got this podcast because I've also started podcasting because podcasts are amazing. Awesome. And uh, I've started I've started the Three Wells podcast, which is – and anyway, I, I mentioned this to him and he says, have you heard of Indie Film Hustle? And I go, oh, I don't think – it rings a bell, but I don't think I've – and he says, you've got to listen to it. It's amazing. So this guy in the, like the tip of Africa <laughs> oh my God. in the small little town called Musenberg is telling me about Alex Ferrari. And so I'm like, okay, cool. I'll, I'll check it out. And he, I guess my phone – and I start listening to it and I'm like, oh, this is great. I love what this guy's doing. Alex Ferrari is amazing. So I write – Alex Ferrari on my whiteboard in the tip of Africa. That's, <laughs> Write your that's name. Amazing. That's ridiculous. <laughs> on my whiteboard, like contact Alex Ferrari. So I'm thinking like, how am I going to contact him? I could email him out of the blue. And then two or three weeks later, I'm in this, um, this sort of joint session with other Michael Visser Productions, who's my publishers. Um, and they're really good. They kind of, it's a bit of a family publisher and we all, we all meet with each other. And suddenly this woman, Diane Bell, who's a friend of yours, is on this, you know, Thing with me and she says oh you guys should meet with Alex Ferrari and I'm like yes I was like yeah I want to meet with him and that's how and that's how I ended up sitting here in Johannesburg South Africa talking to you in I, LA it's like I, I find it it's, it's it's humbling but I've never heard a story and it's just I, I wanted to I wanted to bring it out because I wanted to make a point of it which is yeah. you never know as a creator as an artist as a writer what your work will do in the world, where it will reach, who it will reach, at what point it will reach them. So I'm here yep. in in Los Angeles. I sit here in my 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 cave with this little microphone, yeah, 
And uh, Yoda. Yoda's in the background. Yes, yes. My life size Yoda's in the background. And I sit there and I and I talk on this, uh, you know, into the into the into the ether. And yet, that story is so amazing to me because some guy who I've never met in a no. coffee shop in Johannesburg <laughs> is, <laughs> is he was in Cape Town. In Cape, yeah. Excuse me, sorry, sorry, in Cape Town. And and he's telling you about my podcast, which then I you know. and then how everything worked out is amazing. So I, I always tell artists, I always tell writers and filmmakers, it is your responsibility to get your work out there. It's your responsibility to tell yeah. your stories because you have no idea the impact that your story will have on another human being. It could be just one person who watches a yep. movie you write, watches a television episode watches a short film that you direct or feature or whatever content yeah. you create and it can yeah. change their life. And I'm not saying that you ch I changed your life or anything like that. I'm just saying as a general statement that yeah. our art, yeah. our, our work has the potential to Absolutely. do something like that. So I thank you for being, I think that's amazing. Yeah. I thank you for telling that story. I wanted to make that thank point. <laughs> no, no, it's good. Cause you know, the other thing is like when you're in the flow of creativity as well, these things happen. I don't yep. know if you've found this, but oh, like yeah. once you start just creating and doing and, and putting stuff out there, suddenly, I mean, what you've been doing is like, you know, you're putting, you're just putting stuff out there and like things start happening and, and the flow oh. happens. And the next thing you know, I'm talking to you and like that's just it's like incredible how that happens but it's got to do with like unblocking and flowing you know I'll, I'll tell you I'll tell you what when I launched Indie Film Hustle three and a half years ago I was blocked I mean I just that, the yeah. doors were shut to me I couldn't talk to anybody anything all of a sudden because I decided to give back and start and start building mm -hmm. Indie Film Hustle up I I have now options to talk to people that I've never in a million years would have if I would have just you know, maybe if I would have emailed you out of the blue I'm like hi I'm a filmmaker yeah. you know can I talk to you for an hour and yeah. just like pick your brain like yeah. that's not something that that you okay. would do but because of me yeah. just putting stuff out there constantly doors swing open all the time and that's I get to have this amazing true. experience with having a conversation with you on the other side of the world about screenwriting exactly, yeah. which is you yeah. know, wonderful. And then on top of that, our conversation is now going to be shared with hopefully yeah. thousands of tens of thousands of people around the world. And hopefully yeah. it will make an impact in their life one way, shape or form. So it, it's a wonderful place to be. Thank you. It is. And I feel very humble and grateful to be part of this. So let's talk. I'm going to ask you a few questions. Um, okay, what on. advice would you give <laughs> a screenwriter wanting to break into the business today? Okay. That's a great question. Um, Oh, it's a really good question. <laughs> I think, you know, the first thing that came to mind was persistence. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I wanted to say, be persistently yourself, if that's possible. So, so you know, it, it's like, this is me. This is my voice. This is what I'm writing. This is who I am. And being true to that is really difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then persistently doing it with precision. Okay, as well, mm -hmm. because, you know, don't don't just write any old script and persistently give me that script and, and the script <laughs> is bad, right? <laughs> that would be bad. Right. <laughs> but but like, yeah, persistently be yourself with precision. So 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 read other scripts. Oh, actually, God, maybe that's you know what? I'm going to take all that back and I'm just going to say read scripts. OK, read lots of scripts <laughs> because <laughs> I noticed on your on your page, you've got like links to scripts. Oh, like many hundreds of scripts, and hundreds and, and a thousand. You know, now, yeah, please just so look, if you if you're trying to break into the industry, I suppose, look, if you're just trying to write a really good script, then then read many, many scripts. But if you're trying to break into this into the industry, then just persistently be yourself with precision. I think that would be my my bit of advice. That is an amazing piece of advice because I always tell people the same thing in the sense of be yourself. That's who you, they can't make another you. And I always tell people no. like, I've, I've meet directors who are like, I want to be the next Tarantino. I want to be the next Fincher. I want to yeah. be the next Nolan. I'm like, yeah. dude, I hate to break it to no. you. We've got a Fincher. We've got a <laughs> Nolan and we got a Tarantino. And I promise yeah. you, they're exactly. so much better at being themselves than you will ever be. So you've got to be the best yep. Matthew. I've got to be the best Alex. And that is it. And and, and exactly. that is the secret stuff. That is it. Because no one can compete. That is the secret stuff. No one can ever, I will never be able to compete with Matthew Khalil. No. In the same way no. 
that you will not be able to compete with me in the sense that I can never be no, you. Absolutely. And you can never be yeah, me. Exactly. And that's, you know, exactly. It's we are who we are, period, in whatever and, we do. Yeah. And I think we get very caught up as creative people by looking. So I look at you and I go, oh my God, Alex Ferrari, he's done all this stuff and he keeps, <laughs> he keeps making stuff and he keeps putting part. <laughs> I've got to do that too. If I don't do that, I'm not successful. Meanwhile, my book, The Three Worlds of Screenwriting, is like zen and calm <laughs> not, and me. Not, and that's who I am. That's the different. We're, you know both, what I mean? we're both very and, different energies. But like I look at someone like and, Gary Vanderchuk, right? I love Gary yeah. V. I look at Gary yeah. V and I'm like, oh, man, I got to do what more like what Gary V's doing. I got to get out there. I got to put more stuff. Out. I like to look Tim Ferriss. I got to do more stuff yeah. like Tim Ferriss and what he's doing. Yeah. I'm but, like, <laughs> but, but I, it's great to be inspired by other people. But at the end, yeah, of, the yeah, day, totally. yeah. but at the end of the day, the race is with yourself. Always. Exactly. Period. Exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah. Now, can you tell me the book that had the biggest impact on your life or career? Oh. Wow. Huh. That's a really good question. Um, sure. Okay. You know what is? I think it is this. It's very, <laughs> it's very bizarre, but I, but I'm just going to go with it. Mm -hmm. um, is this really the book? I think it is. Okay, it's Fran it's Franz Kafka's The Trial. Okay, okay, okay sure. Yeah, that's which, is, which, is, which is really weird. But I'm just gonna. So, so the reason is, I read that when I was really young. Mm -hmm. I was like, jeez, I don't know, like eight, six, sixteen, seventeen, and I, I read this book, and I had no idea what it was. I didn't know what it was. I knew it was great. And I knew that it was like, um, I knew it was a mystery. I had no idea what was going on, yeah. but I was fascinated by it. I was fascinated by the tone and, and, and I loved being lost in that space of not knowing what it was. So I've kind of constantly looked at stories, I think, from that place onwards in a sort of almost literary analysis kind of way mm -hmm. to try and like figure stories out. And so I think actually that book, getting that book and reading it at a young age where I was, I was too young for it. Um, it kind of like, sir, I'm too, that, I'm too okay. young to it. I'm too young for it, sir. <laughs> it's Kafka. It, it's Kafka. It, way, it's Kafka. Like, Please. Like, we're all, we're all too young section, for sir. it. <laughs> We're, we're all too young for we're Kafka. We're all doing for That's Kafka, like man. We're all too young for Kafka. Maybe at 80 you can start. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So I, I'm going to go with that, even though there are a lot of other books that popped into my head, but I think, to be honest, that's probably it, yeah. That's a yeah. great, that's a great it, book. It, it made me want to solve puzzles, which I think is my story, my, yeah, my story brain. That's awesome. Um, now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? <laughs> Um, it links to what we were talking about earlier um, and it's I'm still learning it mm -hmm. definitely almost every day and it's just I am enough yeah I've heard that before on the show many people have said that same thing it's a great great lesson and I'm actually thinking of almost changing and just going i am yeah and not the enough because the enough has got a judgment to it mm -hmm. and it's just i am that's an impossible lesson but i'm learning it. it's <laughs> very really it's learning. very it's zen just, it's very yeah. deep uh, and yeah. i agree with you 110 percent sir uh, if you can if, if you can learn to be uh, to be in that space within yourself and like look i'm comfortable in my own skin i am period yeah is such a powerful place to be as not only a human being, but as an artist, Ooh, that's when Absolutely. the greatest Absolutely. art is made. Some of the greatest art is made I mean, from people who just it. know they, who they are and they don't care about anybody it. else. Look at all the don't. great, look at all the great writers. Look, look at Hemingway, yep. look at Hemingway, yep. Shakespeare, Absolutely. look at, you know, King, Absolutely. all these guys, all, all of them. They just know who they are. They don't care about anybody else. And they just like, I'm it's just going to do this. And, and you know what's amazing is, and you can feel they're not coming from a place of arrogance. No. It's not like, I am, mm -hmm. I am this, mm -hmm. I am that. It's like, just, I am, I'm doing this thing, and this is what I'm doing, and it's amazing. And I'm, we, they don't even say it's amazing. It's just, I'm doing this thing. And like Lynch is, a, you know, he's a master at this. He's oh, just, Lynch man, is doing Lynch. Lynch. Oh, man. And, and does he do Lynch ever? <laughs> but I know. <laughs> Well, I mean, this is it. I mean, Twin Peaks season three. I'm like, when I watched that, I felt just like I did when I was 18, 
reading the trial. It was like, wow. And I was, you know, it was a good, it was a good feeling though. But he does, he does. He just, he's just in that. And that's, it's just, the, I am. And, and, yeah. and just to throw out a quick, a, a quick plug, um, David Lynch is going to have a masterclass in 2019. Ah, amazing. So everyone listening, you go to IndieFilmHustle.com and I'll have a link for it there. But I just heard about it like wow. yesterday. I was like, oh my God, oh. I want to hear David Lynch talk about his creative process. Uh. I've seen his documentaries. Yeah. He meditates yeah, constantly. Me too, yeah. I love meditating. Yeah, yeah. He's just such an amazing human being. And boy, does it's he. Fantastic. If he If there's a t-shirt that says, I am, boy, that man has it. And then some. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and then totally. Some. totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, three of your favorite films of all time. Three of your favorite films of all time. Okay. Uh, I, knew, I knew you were going to ask this. This is the worst question in the world. It is. But I'm going to try and answer it. Okay. So, you know, it's going to be really sad because I'm not going to mention any Lynch films. Just because, But there's so many of them that I would put in there. Sure. Um, but I'm not going to do it because what I've thought of is with this question, because I knew it was coming because I'd listened to your podcast before. So I was like, okay, you know what? It's going to be the films that when I was really young, I watched on VHS cassette and they just left such an impression on me. Mm -hmm. So in my book, I've got this list where, where, I, where, I try, where, where we use the external sources well to find your theme. And I list the top 10 movies that have influenced me and I ask the, the reader to do the same. And from that, you find the themes you're interested in. It's a nice exercise worth trying. But with this one, I'm going to say, okay, the first one is the Blues Brothers. <laughs> Love the Blues Brothers. <laughs> Love the Blues Brothers, man. They're amazing. <laughs> Okay, the first movie. I'm just like, I can recite that movie back with my brother and I. We can just do the lines, oh, yeah, you know, yeah, and we yeah. can just like, like, just like that. Like, like, it's really uncanny. I can watch the thing in silence probably and like say all the lines. Sure. I love the, I love the humor. I love the acting. I love the comedy pacing. You know, the pacing is just, it's, it's basically like a big blues song. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the pacing in the editing is just like, mm -hmm. oh, it's, it's brilliant. It's a genius song. It's just genius. Yeah, yeah, I love it. The mall sequence yeah, alone. Definitely. The mall sequence alone with the cars is just <laughs> let's not even get And and the Spielberg cameo. I mean, come on, that was great. Yeah, just... yeah, totally. <laughs> I know. It's unbelievable. <laughs> I love it. And you know, only later on in life I, I watched that and I was like, what is that Spielberg? Is that, is that like a nineteen Bruce is that like a nineteen well, when was that movie made? In seventy in the no, was that seventies or eighties? Eighties. Oh, early eighties. So that's early eighties Spielberg. You know, all all yeah. like you know, geeky and like with the glasses, huge. It was great, great. <laughs> he, looks like, he basically looks like the main character from Ready Player One. You know, pretty much, pretty much, <laughs> pretty much, pretty much. All right, okay. second movie. Okay, cool. So second movie, I'm gonna have to go with something again. It's really weird and out there. You might wonder. So a, a surfing movie called Big Wednesday. Of course, yeah, of course. That's yeah. uh, oh, that's cool. uh, who yeah. who directed that? Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so this is like after Apocalypse Now, which is also I could put in there as one of my movies, but mm -hmm. so I'm sneaking other movies in here. But, you know, um, makes this movie about, you know, buddies living and surfing together, spanning, you know, many years. Mm -hmm. And it's just like uh, I watched it when I was younger. And it's just there's something about that film. I just I, I absolutely love it. I, mean, I, love I, could, Millis. I could watch it again and again and again. I love Millis. you know, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think Tarantino once said about that film, surfers don't deserve this film, which is like, yeah, you know, <laughs> I, get, I, get, I get what he's saying. I get what he's saying. <laughs> yeah. And the third one? Okay. Uh, the third one, uh, okay, again, I'm going to go with the movies that I watched when I was younger on VHS, and that's North by Northwest. Oh, yeah, of course. So, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's like, it's kind of Hitchcock, but what happened is the reason that it's so important for me is that, so in the movie, I mean, it's kind of a spoiler alert, but not really, uh, is like the first, 10 or 15 minutes of the film, the, the sort of setup phase um, is this guy and, you know, he goes to this place and he gets uh, almost killed and, you know, he, he kind of um, gets put in a car and he gets forced off a cliff and then he goes to the police station and he says, no, 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 this is what happened to me. And he brings them back to the house and everything's been cleaned it, and it looks like, it looks like he's insane. Like all of the stuff that happened to him hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. And that's where the VHS tape that I had in those days ended. Oh. So, so I watched the first 15 minutes of the movie and I didn't know what happened. <laughs> oh my God. So then, yeah, yeah. So later on in life, when I watched the rest, I was like, oh, okay. And then I, and then I kind of, yeah. And then I, I just loved it. Yeah. So I still, I still really enjoyed it. It's one of those films that I could watch again. The crop duster sequence, you know, that's just like, I can watch that crop duster sequence where, you know, he's running away from the crop. I can watch that again and again and again. But yeah, there's many other movies, and I would love to choose. I would love to choose them. But those are the. I think those are the three that 
had a real effect on me when I was younger. Awesome, man. Now, where can people find you and your work? Okay, uh, now, where can people find okay, you cool. and your work? So the, oh, the easiest place is probably the threewells.com, mm -hmm. my website. Um, and on that, you got links to my everything, my Facebook pages, my Instagram pages. Um, those are probably the easiest. I've got YouTube channels with stuff on. I've got a podcast as well, the Three Wells podcast, where we interview local uh, South African at the moment screenwriters, but also we're going internationally mm -hmm. about their creative processes. Um, so, yeah, if you just Google the Three Wells, mm -hmm. you'll find stuff. Uh, but threewells.com is probably the best place. And then to get hold of the book, it's everywhere. It's on Amazon. It's on wherever you want to find it. It should be in, lo in your local bookstores in LA. And uh, also uh, Michael Visser Productions, their website's mwp.com. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, you can find me on there. But, yeah, I suppose homepage, the threewells.com. Matthew, it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you, man. Thank you so much for coming Thanks. on the show and dropping some major knowledge bombs on the tribe today. So thank Bam. you, man. Yeah. Awesome.